So thank you guys for having me. So I'm Ryan Shea from Blockstack. As mentioned, I'm going to talk about decentralized app applications and sovereign identity. And who here knows is familiar with Blockstack? Anyone? Cool. All right. Who here is familiar with one name? Cool. All right. So a few for both. So one name was an original, an early product that my team worked on. And we built this identity system on top of the blockchain. And we actually expanded the software, the scope of the software that we were providing to be more than just identity, to be identity, naming, authentication, and storage. And that's the goal of that is to build a full decentralized application platform for developers to build decentralized applications and then for users to use them. So that's where the connection uh, between one name and the current incarnation of Blockstack comes in. So I'm here to talk to you about decentralized apps and sovereign identity. And if you want to tweet about blocks, if you want to tweet about this event, uh, if you want to mention Blockstack or myself, this is the Twitter handle blo at Blockstack.org. And if you want to mention me as well, you can tweet at Ryan E. Shea on Twitter. So a little bit about me. So I am a founding contributor of Blockstack. I'm also president emeritus of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Club. I'm also an alumnus of Y Combinator and Forbes 30 Under 30. And I have authored several popular cryptography libraries. So and now I'm one of many people who are working on Blockstack, one of the many core team members. There is Larry, Jude, Guy, Manib, Patrick, Daniel, many other people who are working on Blockstack. It's a very large community. We have thousands of people in our online and offline community. I'll get to that a little bit more later. So I want to frame this conversation by first talking about how the internet didn't turn out as we had hoped it would. In fact, this was, there was a certain way that the internet was envisioned. There's a certain way that the internet started out. The internet was built in a way that it was meant to be decentralized. It was built in a way that it would be completely amorphous, completely resilient to any type of uh, control, in a way that anyone could just put up their own content on the internet and anyone else could connect to it. Right? It's a, it's a platform for innovation, for freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And a platform for permissionless operation, and permissionless innovation. So unfortunately, several things have gone wrong with the internet. As we've built out, as we have realized new capabilities, we have settled upon a certain state of being. And some of these issues are the fact that we have honeypots and these third-party hacks. A good example is Yahoo, which got hacked and resulted in the compromise of a billion people's information. Tracking, data harvesting, and invasive ads. So there's a lot of this that happens beneath the surface that we don't fully appreciate what is happening, but we're being tracked all over the web. Any, any uh, website that uses Google Analytics, Google has the ability to track you on all those different sites. Any website that has a Facebook like button, Facebook has the ability to track you on all those different sites. We are being tracked. Our data is being harvested. It's being sold. It's being used in order to manipulate our public, our personal opinions, whether that be for manipulate us for the election. It's being used to manipulate us into buying things. As we saw, there are a lot of companies that are using very fine-tuned targeting in order to get you to vote for a particular candidate. And it has been used, apparently, with pretty wide success, at least in the US election. So. <laughs> um, Cracked passwords and account compromises. Passwords are insanely terrible, both in terms of user experience and in terms of security. Password uh, platform lock-in for users and developers. It's very difficult for us to take our data from one platform to another. If you're using a note-taking app like Evernote, it's not very simple for you to just migrate to a new note-taking app. You are locked into that app. If you 
want to use a particular social network and you have your friends there on Facebook. It's very hard for you to bring your friends to another application. You're locked into that platform. If you want to, if you are using a particular application for chat, it's very hard for you to migrate your conversations from one chat application to another and to preserve that history. So with all these things, we are being locked into the software. So if, if we're locked in and we can't choose, we can't easily migrate, well, is it really our data? We can't export it. It's not in a format that's easily readable by other, other services. No, in, instead, it's in their proprietary format. It's in their database. It's not our data. We are renting our data from these companies, right? Restrictions on platform data access. So there's a lot of APIs that are, that are out there that developers rely upon. There's Twitter API, there's Facebook API, there's a LinkedIn API, et cetera. All of these APIs, they, there's, there's some level of access for developers, but to a very large extent, these companies restrict access and they decide, they play gatekeeper and they decide who gets to use it. And this results in both the developers losing because they can't build the things that they want and they can't compete. It's actually anti-competitive behavior. But it also results in a very large amount of loss of opportunity for the user because we have less software that's available to us to use. And then, of course, the power and profits go to the very few. If you look at advertising on the internet, almost all of that growth is going to Facebook and Google, almost everything, greater than 50%. There's two companies, Facebook and Google, are harvesting all of this money from this one particular business model. And a few very large companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple, represent an enormous amount of wealth, so much greater than all of the other companies uh, in the space. We can do better, right? We can do much better than all this. And really what the future holds, if we do our jobs right, is we can get rid of data silos, we can get rid of middlemen, ads, tracking, passwords, and lock-in. Right, all of these things. Wouldn't that be great if we can get rid of all these things? Absolutely, right? So the problem is that we, there, there's just not a, there's not a good way to achieve this yet. And so this is really what we're working towards, what we're trying to achieve with Blockstack. And that key is to building a platform where users can own their identity and data and they can log in to discover and use, log into applications that let them bring their identity and data with them. And we've taken the approach of focusing on the application platform because you need to start somewhere. And at least I believe that the best applications that are going to satisfy all of these are going to be built natively on a platform where you own your identity and data. So just like a lot of the biggest winners of the internet were native internet companies, like Facebook, Google, and Amazon, I believe that some of the biggest winners in this new model, this new world order, are going to be blockchain native or, oh, my next time. Block, uh, they're, they're going to be blockchain native, or they're going to be native to this model where you own your identity and data. All right, so we have apps. I'd like to introduce this new concept, which is we're, we're very familiar with applications. We're familiar with being able to communicate, watch content, send money. But there's this new term that I'd like to introduce, which is very different from applications, which is app systems. And you may be familiar with this as decentralized apps. I think the term app systems is a little more apt because, decentral because decentralized apps suggest that they're actually apps. But email isn't an app, right? Bitcoin isn't an app. BitTorrent isn't an app. They're really networks that are all speaking the same language, where, where there's different applications that are speaking the same language. It is a system of applications that are all working with each other and able to communicate. 
So I'll go through each of these, email, BitTorrent, Bitcoin. So email is arguably the first app system or decentralized application. And what's remarkable about email is that, well, first of all, that it's, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been around for a very long time, and it's been, it was built in a way that would facilitate many different clients being able to communicate with one another. Today, you can use one of many different clients. You choose your own software, right? Another very notable application system is BitTorrent. So there's a network where you can share files with other people. And there, is, there are many, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of different types of software that you can use on top of the BitTorrent network. And you can use any type of client that you'd like. And the third example that I'd like to highlight is Bitcoin. And this is the one that we're most excited about today, right? Bitcoin is sim in the same way, in a similar fashion, to how you can use whatever email client you want, you can use whatever BitTorrent client you want, you can use whatever Bitcoin wallet you want. And if I have one Bitcoin wallet and you have another Bitcoin wallet, we can both send money to one another. There's this underlying network, this protocol, and all of, all of us can all operate with whatever software we choose. It's permissionless innovation. It is you control whatever you have inside that application, whether it's you control your money, you control your data, you control your identity in all of these cases. So, one of the concerns is that decentralized systems, decentralized app systems are very difficult to build. So we have concerns in terms of simplicity, security, and scalability, right? And Blockstack actually gives additional capabilities to applications. So with, with the Blockstack way of building applications, you can actually, not only do you have the ability for consumers to own their own identities and data, but they also have the ability to build in signing, encryption, money, and shared data. So there's these new features that we're getting on top of this. So Blockstack, Blockstack's goal is to make building decentralized applications easy, right? If you think about over here, this is the traditional way of building applications. And over here is the way of building applications on top of Blockstack. So traditionally, you have servers to set up and maintain, you have databases, you have to build out your own identity management system, you have to build out your own payment system. You don't have encryption and you don't have data integrity. But with Blockstack you have, it's completely serverless, it's all client side code that's running. You have personal storage APIs instead of databases. So the application gets loaded into the user's browser and then it can access the user's photo stream from the user's personal API, and then it can allow the user to upload photos back to it. There's identity built in, there's payments built in, there's encryption and signing built in. So here's a quick little look at how this works. It's very, very simple. You import the Blockstack.js library, then you ask to log in the user, then you can get the user's photos, and you can upload a photo back to the user's stream. So then a second application that has also access to the user's photo stream can get and put the user's photos. So this is extremely powerful for allowing the user to be in control of their data and allowing the user to have data portability across applications. And it's powerful for commoditizing application UIs. It's really, it's like deep coupling the UI from the data layer, from the actual storage and the protocol and the format of the data so that there can be a lot of innovation on the user interface layer, and consumers can choose whatever they want. So this is what Blockstack is enabling. So Blockstack handles the complexity of all these layers. Blockstack has naming, identity, authentication, and storage built in. And it all runs on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I will say that Blockstack is designed in such a way that is blockchain agnostic. So we have drivers. You can write a driver plug it in, and you can run Blockstack on top of whatever blockchain you want, whether that's Ethereum, Zcash, a federated chain, whatever. However, we have one very large network that runs on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, and that's what we focus on. Because our philosophy is you should always be building on and focusing on the blockchain that has the uh, highest level of security, and has, is hardest to tamper with, and has been most battle-tested. In that case, it's Bitcoin by far. So that's why we operate on top of Bitcoin today. And then 
developers can build these applications on top of Blockstack and utilize these components. So the one that I'd like to focus most on, component of this, is identity, especially given the, the topic at hand. So identity is really the fabric that holds everything together, right? If you want to do, if you want users to control their own data, then you need to have those users to control their own identities. Because if they don't control their identities, then you, you kind of, right, you, you're just going back to the same exact model. So user-controlled data actually depends on user-controlled identity. And when we say identity, we're really talking about a lot of different things. We're talking about a unique entity that the user controls. We're talking about the keys, the digital keys that the user uses to control that entity, right? We're talking about the devices that the user manages that give you them access to the account. We're talking about the ability to attest to certain, the user to attest to certain information about oneself. So you could say that's the user's profile or that's the user's certain private attested information that's selectively disclosed with other parties. We're referring to the reputation the, uh, or the certifications that the user has collected, basically information that other parties have said about the user. We're talking about naming, so we're talking about to, to, another, to, to some extent, identity and naming are merged, right? Where the name is something that is specific to one entity. So we have all these different things. We have, we have an entity, this digital entity, that has keys, it has names, it has profiles, it has private information that can be selectively disclosed, it has information that's been generated by the user, information that's been generated by third parties that's attested to the user. All of these things constitute identity. And when the user controls that one core component, then we can get all of these other things, you know, really everything else that's built on top of that core component, then you can, the user can mix and match them. So for example, if you think about how identities in the physical world work, if you have a driver's license, if you have a passport, this is issued by one central authority. But a new, in a new model, you can actually do it in such a way such that there's no central authority, but instead, you have the ability for you to issue an identity to yourself, and then you have the ability to, if you want it to be accepted and verified, right? For example, if you want it to be verified and accepted by uh, when you go into a bar and you want to prove that you're over 21, if you want it to be ex verified and accepted when you go to a border crossing, well, you need to have this particular thing. A, you need the model to be accepted by these different these, these different organizations, and B, you need the attestations to come from parties that those parties trust. So for example, uh, you can have a national passport authority that issues you your passport, but instead, if you can move towards a model where that authority only becomes a signing entity, and only one of many signing entities that can be mi mixed and matched, then you can have multiple government entities signing your, your identity. You can have multiple organizations signing your identity. You can have your peers and your friends signing your identity. And all of a sudden, you've collected all of these different attestations and identity credentials that you build up and you can selectively disclose and use whenever, in whatever context that you want when you go to, uh, go to authenticate or prove who you are. Right. So next thing I'm going to go into is a little demonstration of this new Blockstack product that we're coming out with, and you can kind of get a feel for how we do identity on the blockchain and how it actually works, right? And what the interface is. So this is our new product that we're coming out with. It's called the Blockstack application. And you download Blockstack, it's Mac OS initially. We're gonna be going to come out with, we're coming out with uh, apps for Windows and for Linux as well. So you download, this application and it runs in your system tray and it has a background process that serves up an API and it serves up this dashboard that you can use to manage your identities, your profiles, 
that you can use to manage a Bitcoin wallet, where you can change account settings and manage your data storage. And then you can have other applications that you install and show up on your dashboard, very similar to iOS or Android. And I can also search for other people's profiles. So if you're familiar with OneName, it's similar experience. All of the identities on OneName work here as well, and all of the identities here work on OneName. So it's, it shares the same uh, actual, the same directory on Blockstack on the Bitcoin blockchain. So I can, for example, go in and search for, for Tim. I'll go search for Tim Berners-Lee. Let's see if he's here. There we go. So this is actually his profile, by the way. Um, you can see. There we go. So he's verified. So he created an account on, on Blockstack. And you can see that it's actually him because of his identity proofs. So he's proven himself on Twitter, and he's proven himself on GitHub. He didn't really upload a photo or fill out his name, but he's actually uh, verified himself. And then I can go search for my profile. I've created a bunch of them, as you can see, <laughs> for testing. But this is my personal identity. And so this is my credential that I have on the blockchain. And I have added my Bitcoin address. I've added a PGP key. I've added my OpenBazaar account, my OpenBazaar ID. I've added my Twitter account, my GitHub, and my Facebook profile. And all the, these ones that are in green have been verified. So I have the ability to collect all of these verifications on all of the social networks that I have. And I also have the ability to collect verifications for other people. So the web of trust system is coming soon. You'll be able to connect with other people. You'll be able to add them as your friend on the system, and then you, it'll show up all the different people that you're following and that people are following you or that you're friends with. But if I go back here, go back in the Profiles app, I've registered a new identity on here. Well, I'll show you how that actually works. Um, whoops. But you can go and create one, and then you pick a username. And it'll check if it's available. That's been already registered. Checking the price right now. Taking a little bit. I'm assuming the price is based on the amount of the trust and the, um, the price of the transaction of the Bitcoin blockchain. Yes. So it, th there's um, there's a certain there's a there's a price that's the Bitcoin blockchain uh, transaction fee, but then there's also another amount on top that's similar to like you have domain name registration prices and the same thing is, is, is happening here. So I can go and try to register it. Oh, something. I think it's a network issue. But you can go and register it if, if you have enough Bitcoins in your wallet to be able to register it. So, so for example, I have my wallet here and I have 0 .0007 Bitcoins. So whenever I, so I can actually deposit Bitcoins here. Whenever I am registering anything on this application, I have to use my Bitcoins for it. But then I, once, I have an app, once I have an actual identity, I can go and I can edit my profile. So I have filled out my name. I have a, I have a bio. So if you look, take that username, go to onename.com. You can see my profile here as well. Internet's a little slow. There we go. So that's my profile right there. And if I edit this, you'll see that it shows up. I can actually view this publicly. And this is how it looks up looks like on the network. And then I can actually upload new photos. I can add social accounts, so we have verifications for Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, and many more verifications are coming soon. You'll be able to, well, you can actually, you can add all of these accounts today, Instagram, LinkedIn, Tumblr, et cetera. The verifications of those will be supported soon. 
You can also add your Bitcoin address, Ethereum address, PGP key, SSH key, and you have the ability to add private information like your address and your birth date. And other people will be able to attest to that. So if I go back. Just a quick question. All this information is stored in blockchain? No. All right, so he asked the question, like, is this all this information stored in the blockchain? So if you saw right here, this, when I edited it, it came up immediately, right? So what's actually happening is that in the blockchain, there's a, there's a, a secure association between a name, a public key, and a hash. That's the only thing that's put in there. The name and the public key are tied together so that now you know that this public key has the ability to control this name. Same how a particular public key can control Bitcoin. Right? You can use addresses, so you can use multi-sig, multiple public keys. The last link is a hash, and that's a hash of a zone file. So in the domain name system, there's a concept of a zone file, which includes routing information. And so you, you tag your name to your public key to your zone file, which contains routing information. And then you include a URI to the location of where you're hosting your profile information. And oh, there we go. And right. so I'll go into this. So we allow deep photos of this? Sorry? We allow deep photos of this? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, this is public. So the way this works is there's the blockchain layer. And as I said, we're compatible with all the blockchains, but we focus on Bitcoin. And the block stack core nodes scan through the blockchain in sequence, go through each block, and parse the transactions that are tagged as blockchain transactions using a prefix and op return. And that particular prefix, a couple of bytes that refers to, this is a block, block stack transaction. The nodes will pick them up, will detect them, and then will parse them and update a name database in the virtual chain layer. And the name database is, as I said, domain name, public key, and zone file hash. And then the zone files themselves <coughs> are stored in the zone file database. Because the hash, if you anchor the hash in the blockchain, that's the equivalent to attesting to the zone file itself. And the zone file hash to zone file mapping is in the routing layer in what's, what we call the Atlas network. So every single, every single block stack node both contains the name database and the zone file database. And so you can look up a domain name to a hash to a zone file itself follow the zone file which has URIs which point to stored data up here. So in that example that I just showed you, when, when you were looking at my profile information, we can go and unpack this. And we can, we'll, we'll do that using the block stack explorer. And as you can see, here's the Bitcoin address that owns it. And here is the zone file. So uh, here we go. Name registration. Transaction ID. So here's the transaction on blockchain.info. And as you can see, there is a transaction. There's an op return. I believe that's the op return. Here we go. So if you can see that right there, it has my username right here, Ryan underscore Feb 23id And that's inside of an op return transaction. And then we can go in and look at the name update. And look at that transaction. And we can see this right here is actually a hash. So that's this is a particular hash that's being stored in here. And this hash corresponds to this right here this value hash. 
And that hash is a hash of this file right here. And that file has a URI inside of it. As you can see, that's a Dropbox URL, dropbox.com. I just downloaded it. And that is my profile information. You can see my name, first name, last name, and an image. It's stored on Dropbox because I connected my Dropbox right here. So we have the ability for you to log into Dropbox. We're going to add all kinds of other storage providers later. We're going to add Amazon S3. We're going to add Google Drive. We're going to add the ability for you to use your own self-hosted storage solution. We're going to add the ability for you to use IPFS, for you to use BitTorrent, for you to use whatever you want. So the idea is, and you can actually use multiple. So you have your information. It gets automatically uploaded to your storage providers. And then for private information, it's encrypted before it actually hits the storage provider. So they can see nothing. Dropbox can see nothing. Google can see nothing. You're basically just using them as disk, dumb disk. They see nothing, right? And so that's how it all works. Um, did, that, did that answer your question for, for the? Uh, yeah. yeah. OK, OK. 